So as an architecture and design writer, um, you know, the thing that really struck out to me about burglary and what drew me to it is that burglary is, uh, it's, it's very specifically an architectural crime. Um, so burglary cannot exist without the built environment. It's not the same thing as theft. Uh, in fact, uh, you can be a burglar for your entire life and never steal anything. And you can also steal things for your entire life uh, and not be a burglar. Um, so any felony or the uh, conspiracy or intention to commit one inside an architectural space in which you don't have permission to be can be legally considered burglary. And so that has a lot of really interesting and strange um, implications as, as I'll be discussing over the next half hour or so and as we can get into with questions at the end, um, which, would, which would be, I, I would encourage you to, to have some of you, uh, I, I love talking about this stuff. Um, but so I really wanted to dive into that notion that burglary and architecture were legally connected but also very conceptually connected. And so um, the first thing I wanted to talk about was, uh, is actually the title of the talk, which is the notion of breaking the close. And so what's fascinating about burglary is that it even legally redefines uh, w where architecture begins and ends. And so um, it may seem, you know, it's even a kind of a, 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 an eye-rolling uh, joke in a lot of architecture schools where, you know, whether or not we truly understand the difference between inside and outside, um, whether or not uh, we actually can make that distinction. Um, but what's interesting about burglary is that it actually does call that, that distinction between inside and outside into, into, in, into question. Um, and that's this thing called the close, which is this invisible line with, that uh, uh, exists, uh, surrounds objects in a kind of, um, you know, I, could, I might describe it as a kind of legal crystallography. Um, it's a series of invisible planes that defines inside and outside. And so think about, so a couple examples here would be, think about a, a convertible car parked on the street with its top down. Um, think about a house with a uh, screened-in porch where there are no screens on the, uh, uh, installed on, on the porch on a particular day. Um, think about your own home or apartment, but the, win the windows are open or the um, uh, front door is open. Um, there may not physically be a surface that, that differentiates one side from another, the public world from the private world, um, but nonetheless there is a legally recognizable surface called the close, and the close of course is not clothing, but the close is enclosing a door or an enclosure. Um, that, that maintains that, that, that fiction of, of inside and outside. And so that might, necessarily, might not necessarily sound particularly uh, interesting. Uh, it's very abstract, but what's um, pretty shocking about this actually is the extent to which burglary can be attached to things based on minuscule crossings of an invisible barrier that basically only lawyers can see. Um, so a good example of that was a case where an individual uh, came up to a home and was threatening the homeowner. Um, the threat in this case is a felony, and as this individual did so, he leaned against the front of the house. There was a, on the windowsill, the window was open, and the tips of his fingers crossed the invisible line from outside to inside. Um, in tandem with threatening the homeowner, that was enough to get this guy nabbed for burglary. So the tips of his fingers broke the clothes, and that constituted physical entrance into a, into a space. Um, you may recall actually an interesting um, thing in New York City, maybe three or four years ago, where um, uh, as an art project, um, these two individuals replaced the American flags with white flags, like surrender flags. Um, it was interesting li listening to the police uh, actually kind of, um, you know, grind their teeth and fantasize about the kinds of things they could charge these guys with. Um, but one of them was burglary. Uh, well, so interestingly enough, it was because of the fact that in order to get to the top of the Brooklyn Bridge, which is obviously 100% outside in any layman's understanding of the Brooklyn Bridge, um, they had to go over a fence and into a, a kind of fenced in area that from the point of view of the law could be considered an internal space that they broke into with the intention of committing a crime of both vandalism and trespassing and any other things they wanted to throw. And so that was an act of burglary in uh, plain air. So you can imagine, in other words, a whole series of um, kind of uh, malign architectural interventions on private property here in San Francisco or on corporate property in a city like Manhattan where uh, small, um, almost imperceptible additions to the facade of a building could be used legally to entrap people in burglary without realizing that they've in fact stepped inside of something. Um, so briefly again, I just want to mention that the other thing that this does is that it also gives um, I kind of compare it to almost like an augmentation spell. So if you have done a certain crime, whether it's a, a violent crime or a crime of drug possession or a handgun or that kind of thing, um, it's a very good way to simply uh, extend a sentence that would otherwise have been um, much shorter or to nab someone because you couldn't get them for the crime they were actually doing, uh, but you can get them for burglary simply by dint of the fact that it occurred within an architectural space that they didn't have permission to be in. And so it's a very interesting crime. It's added on to things and um, has that peculiar relationship to inside and outside. 